Well, hello and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast, a podcast about engineering, AI, neuroscience, and other interesting topics of life to educate and inspire people all around the world. I'm your host, Yusuf, and today we welcome the two minds behind Atlantis Sea Colony, short ASC, Brandon and Adam. Their goal is to colonize the oceans by providing underwater hotels, houses, and habitats for the masses. Atlantis Sea Colony is currently seeking out a location as well as funding to bring their Phase 1 product to life. Phase 1 will be the largest underwater habitat currently in existence and truly allow for a one-of-a-kind experience for those that visit it. Situated in around 60 feet of water allows for optimal lightning and viewing conditions of the surrounding world. Whether visiting for scientific research, a weekend getaway or even part of a family vacation and especially in those times in case of a pandemic, ASC delivers a reality unlike any other. If you want to support the guys and share their vision, please make sure to support them. Links to their website, social media, as well as their Patreon page can be found in the description. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, have fun with a podcast about Atlantis Sea Colony. I think we can just get started. Um, so we have Adam and Brandon here. And maybe one of you guys, maybe Brandon can start and introduce his uh, idea to the audience. <coughs> sure. Uh, my name is Brandon Traxler. You know, I'm uh, based on the owner and... Uh, guy behind Atlantis Sea Colony. Uh, what Atlantis Sea Colony is, is a work for 25 years now. I came up with it back in high school and the whole principle was I wanted to create underwater cities. And as I started researching more and more, I realized that that might be a little audacious goal at first. So it streamlined down to why not build underwater habitats? And then, you know, as I, as the internet came around, you know, because I graduated in 1996. So back very early internet days, um, when we got the internet and stuff, I was able to start researching and, and start diving more into this vision and saw, hey, this is possible. There are some, the science community has already done this. Let's just turn this into something where anybody can live underwater um, re regardless of your age, your health, things like that. I didn't want people to have to scuba dive down to be able to explore and to live underwater. And so that's kind of what the whole project is, is, is building self-contained, self-sustainable underwater habitats, whether for personal use, corporate use, or whatever. Sounds amazing. Yeah, Adam, what, Adam what's your position in the, in the whole company? I think you are two-man um, like two army, right? Yeah, I, I kind of uh, invited myself to help Brendan like about a year ago. <laughs> He, Brendan's been a, a very good friend of mine for, gosh, it's probably, you've been close to 20 years now, Brendan. Yeah. So, um You know, and we've always kind of talked about it off and on. And but the you know the past couple of years, Brendan's got really into it and like really started to push forward and make sure that you know this becomes his his life passion. And uh, you know, in the past few years, I've uh, gotten into podcasting and doing just different things. And I decided that it just wasn't fun to do by myself the podcasting thing. Um, so, but I wanted a project to work on. So, like I said, I kind of just told Brendan, I'm like, hey, I'm going to come help you. Like, tell me what I can do to help you. So I've been helping him like with social media stuff. And uh, um, we launched the Colonize the Ocean podcast together. And um, just, uh, and I have, I have a background in manufacturing. That's what I've been doing since I've left high school. So, you know, once we get to the the physical aspect of this, I told, I've told Brendan several times that, I want to be involved in actually building this thing. So um, I, I try to be helpful, but really uh, Brendan's the, the brains behind mostly everything here. I see. And what phase are you currently? Is it like phase zero where you just plan everything or is it like already phase one, phase two? Where are you at? Yeah, right, right now we've got it all planned out. Basically, I mean, with like a lot of this stuff, it kind of boils down to the money at this point in time. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, we've got different plans out there. Um, It's, it's, it, I, I, I tell Adam before, I was like, you know, if I had the money, I'd build the thing tomorrow. It's, that's how sure I am in the plans that we've got and, and the ability to do it. It's just, uh, and that's where Adam's come on board as far as helping to, to raise the brand awareness and the notoriety of who the company is and what we're doing so that we can in turn raise money to, to get this thing built. Mm -hmm. What What's the end plan? Like if you had like unlimited amount of money, what, what is your dream? Or what is sure. the dream of you? I, Yeah, well, I mean, you know, mine obviously is, you know, I, you know, 
the whole purpose is to colonize the ocean. So, you know, underwater hotels, underwater data centers, I see big data, you know, Google, Amazon, stuff like those. Microsoft has already experimented with this a little bit about putting a data center underwater. Um, so I think there's tons of money in that. Um, you know, private underwater houses, um, you, you know, anything that you have on land, you, you could transplant to underwater and you just have a whole different scenery. You know, you look at people who want bomb shelters or fallout shelters, you could do the same thing with that just underwater. So there's a bunch of different applications you can have for this. Um, it just needs to get one built and start moving from there. Mm, so do you already have a prototype like 3D printed or something like that? I've got a bunch of different, uh, you know, designs. Um, and I have, I've been thinking about 3D printing them. Actually, I'm working on a, a physical mock-up right now that I've been, I'm, I'm making. It's not done yet. Um, and I'll be showing that off on the social media stuff along those lines once that's done, you know, a scaled model version of it. But yeah. Mm. Are there any legal issues, by the way, because I'm quite curious if, if you just say I'm building something underwater, are there any legal issues? <laughs> like, of course, you have to, to buy the, the land underwater right. uh, did you inform yourself about that already yeah it depends on where you're at i mean it also depends on how far out in the ocean you are too so it there's it changes if you're in the united states there's a lot of different legal issues you gotta go through versus if you're in some foreign countries that are a little more lax and then if you're out far enough it becomes international waters but then getting the supplies to it becomes a different thing so it is a it's a roller coaster of weighing the value versus what you want to do in there as well. So location wise, I'm not there yet because let's get a, the designs finalized and shown off and get somebody that, and then we can start looking at different locations. That being said, uh, we we have, I, you know, I have some, I have a friend from high school that he's got some land in a Central American company on the coast that I've already talked to him about. That's a possibility. And there's other locations that, you know, I'm, I'm sure would not be an issue too. Mm, I see. And uh, like, I think it's it's a bit like I also told uh, Adam this. The idea is basically something like Elon has, like with this uh, tunnel system, because you're kind of restricted in 2D, like when it comes to area and surface. But when you go to height, you can basically go up to space or down in, into the water. So we're kind of unlimited in that in that sense, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. With uh, with the. I mean, <clears throat> I, I think back to one of the bad Superman movies that they made years ago where uh, Lex Luthor said something about real estate is the one thing that they're not making anymore. Um, and that's kind of been one of the things I've thought about with this where, yeah, it's uh, once you cross the, the political issues and the legal issues of being able to uh, utilize the, the ocean as a uh, option for habitation and colonization, whatever it may be, um, but I mean, there's an endless opportunity. I mean, the, the world is 70% water, yeah. um, granted there's safety things that you got to look at too, you know, depth issues. And that's everything that we're, we're looking at with it. But I mean, it opens up a huge amount of possibilities by being able to do that. And Brendan says a lot, you know, that, um, we're, we're really inspired by the things that like Elon Musk is doing and, um, all these like independent companies that are trying to do the, the, space exploration and space colonization but um we don't foresee ourselves ever having the guts to get on a rocket to go out to outer space but you know th there's enough safety things that we know about that you know we can get trained in scuba and we can well brendan is trained in scuba mm -hmm. i'm not but to be able to dive down and you know i'd rather be 30 to 40 feet underwater than thousands of miles on a different planet not know what's going on yeah right uh, especially at, the, at that time now where you don't know anything like you don't know if the rocket will fail <laughs> right so this project moon thing is going on right where they want to send this uh, this rich guy from japan i think yeah yeah yeah. Moon, yeah that's kind of interesting uh, do you have like a rough estimate what it will cost approximately if you built like a basic model underwater yeah so <clears throat> i'm I met with uh, engineers a couple of years ago in, in, here in the United States that started looking at what I was doing and, and started talking to them. And um, they wouldn't give me any estimates at that point in time on, on cost because they wanted to say, hey, let's, let's, let's get this aspect, let's get the blueprints finalized, stuff along those lines. Um, but, you know, we're looking at just the proof of concept, like phase one. Um, and, and, you know, we're looking... 100, 150,000, more or less, 200,000, just for that, that one, which will be a really rough 
you know, it's in the water, it works type of thing. But, you know, when we start getting ones that are available to the public and stuff along those lines, you're, you're looking up closer to a million dollars at that point in time. Mm, I see. Okay. But still like, quote unquote, affordable. Yeah. yeah. And once again, and as you, and with anything, as you start making more and more of them, you can bring that cost down too. So, you know, we definitely like to bring that cost much further down. And I think with technology constantly increasing, that's totally doable. And the, the million may be even a little high, but it's hard to say until you've built that first one, really what that cost is going to be. Yeah, definitely. That's, that's where, uh, like <clears throat> I said, with my background in manufacturing, one of the things that um, I've been a part in, in the company I work for, and even my dad started a company that he he manufactures and uh, just um, having education in lean manufacturing, which is, you know, all about um, being efficient, cost effective and just using creativity to to lower your costs. And, you know, and that's one of the things Brennan and I talk about a lot and kind of um, just echoing what Brennan said is that, um, you know, once you get the initial thing, yeah, it might be expensive at first, but then you can take a look at it. Um, understand what supplies you used and the processes you used to build it um, and just be able to start thinking creatively to lower those costs and do that. I mean, once again, I hate to constantly look at Elon Musk as the person that we're referring to, but I mean, that's exactly what he's done. He's, he's turned what the, the space exploration and space business into something that is becoming more affordable. I mean, still for people that make more money than I do, but it's a, it's, you know, a lot more feasible. And as time progresses, it, it's uh it'll only get cheaper and cheaper to do. And, and to that point right now, what, <clears throat> excuse me, what we're working on right now is, is working with different manufacturers and getting a parts list together and saying, Hey, here's what we need. Here's what's going to so we, we have a detailed part list and we're actually in the process of doing that right now, reaching out to different, um, you know, for like the, the, the window aspect, what's this going to cost and try to get detailed price lists. So we, then we got a good price point at that time. Then we can reach out to people say, Hey, here's how much this is going to cost. And here's what we need to do. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, like echoing what Adam said, like Elon Musk, we just picked up the rocket books, rocket science books yeah. and saw what he needed. And then he just tried to buy the stuff himself by himself. Right. Pretty much. Yeah, we don't have a company like PayPal that we can sell off and have the money to <laughs> to get us started, though. <laughs> yeah, and um, did you already talk to investors, like interested in really interested in your idea? I've had two investors reach out to me. Uh, we had some talks back and forth. Um, both those fell through. I, I got a friend I talked to about this early on. He's like, you'll have countless investors come and go. He goes, it's just the nature of the beast that everybody's interested in the idea, but when it actually comes to sign the check, he goes, it's going to be hard to, to find that, that right person that not only your personalities, uh, you know, meet together as well, but has the same vision for you. Cause a lot of investors come in and they're like, well, I like this, but I want this changed. And how much of that change are you willing to, to give up? you know, of your, of your dream, your vision here. And I've run into that a little bit. Um, but yeah, so far the, the couple of investors we've talked to that it just hasn't worked out yet. I see. I mean, you have this vision already for like 26 years now. Yeah. 26 years, right? 1994. Yeah. It's a quite a long time. Yeah. And I think it's, um, I think we all have like a lot of ideas, but then when it comes to execution, sometimes it's a bit rough and hard especially yeah. in this business because your project for instance is like bigger than when I say, Hey, I have a YouTube project. I want to do a video. It's something <laughs> completely different. And then bringing Elon in again, like it's also like a whole another level. So. Yeah. But you know, I, I say with people that comment there, I get that a lot. It's like, Oh, well, your vision is much bigger than mine. And, and it's a big vision. I mean, there's no argument there, but it's with anybody. It's just doing it, whether it is a YouTube channel or whether it's, just writing a book, you know, something simple like that. It's the dedication to do it and the patience to see it through. Cause it could take you anywhere from months to decades. And in, you know, in fairness, we say 26 years, but there's a huge chunk of time there where I just let it drop off. And it's like, I'm worried about my nine to five job and the Atlanta sea colony was on the back burner. And then I said, you know, I, I got to do something with this thing or let this dream die. And so that's where we're at. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I can put it as, as a quote by before the video, like Brennan said this, <laughs> <laughs> Adam, when did you when did you say when did you join the the company? I I guess like officially I started. Man, it was just August, so really I haven't been here a full year. But like I said, Brendan's been a very close friend of mine for twenty years. So um, we 
we've talked about it, you know, off and on. And, but you know, like I said, uh, about two, three years ago when like Brendan just said, he really start wants to make this thing happen as opposed to just, you know, let it die off. So, um, but yeah, about, I'd say like nine months that I've really been involved heavily with it. But I love it to be honest. Like, um, but at no point in time you said to Brendan, like, okay, that's not possible for instance. No, like when he, um, when like we first uh, became friends years ago, and he would talk about it, and he had his, he had, I mean, the website's been up for a long time, but like he said, it, like a lot of us were focused on our nine to fives and were in our you know our lives that we have going on, but uh, you know I was asked about it. I don't think there's a lot of things that I like to make fun of Brendan for, but it's uh, um, Atlanta Sea Colony. I don't think was ever one of them. So, um, but the thing is, is like when. With with uh, Brendan, what he said, where a lot of people would think this is a, a crazy idea, an audacious idea. Well, that's kind of right up my alley because I, when I came on with him, I told him, like, at the end of my life, I don't want to be remembered for being good at something average or, like, something normal. Like, I... Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I want to. I want to have a legacy of being able to say I did something crazy that everybody thought was insane, and you know, I, I, I want to ride Brendan's coattails into seeing this project get accomplished. Yeah, so but I, I that's love, that's I love what it I'm so at. much. The story is, I like it so much actually because you know for uh, each other for so long, and you never told him like, okay, give it up. It's like a stupid dream or something. Because actually, even if you're a friend, you could have said, okay, it's kind of stupid or maybe crazy. Why do you right. try? Let, just stay in your nine to five and do whatever you <laughs> do now. Uh, so, mm. and even that you like have this idea for like twenty six years, I really admire that because you never said, "Okay, <laughs> I'm just throwing it into the trash can." And uh, being consistent, like I think a lot of people have forgot like to be really that dedicated because, in, especially nowadays in social media and stuff like this, everything is like short living. Yeah. So if you're not successful yeah. in like one month, then okay, forget about it. Yeah. Right. And, and you know, that's it's it's still even hard even this day, even though after all this time, we're starting to see this growth of the of the company and, and the brand and, and get excited about it, but at the same time realize that this still may take another five years to actually get the first one in the water, even though we don't want it to take that long. But I'm okay with that because it is a long process. And and, and and I've had plenty of people along the way laugh in my face about it or tell me that's a stupid idea or it's not gonna happen. And why would you ever want to do that? Um, so I've we had have my, people come to our Facebook and say that to us once in a while too. So yeah, so I've had plenty of negativity over the years about it, but it's one of those things where I know it's possible. It's going to happen. It's not a question of who's, but it's just who's going to be the first one to really uh, capitalize on, popularize on it. But it's going to happen eventually, and why not be me? Yeah, sure, I love it. I'm completely supporting you right here. I well, thank you. A, yeah, it's a great idea, and um, yeah. people should know about this for sure. I mean, I haven't I heard about this like before, like, okay, you can go underwater because sometimes, you know, these um, where you can just see the water like below your house or something in like your mm -hmm. living room. But uh, li really living underwater, it's like something crazy, maybe, but something also like, yeah. very adventurous. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's there's very uh, and Brennan knows way more about this, but means I've talked to him so much, but I've got some of this aspect. There's there's a lot of like hotels that advertise being underwater hotels, but um a lot of them have like a walkway that comes from like, like an onshore hotel that you just walk to a tunnel out to like a little bubble that's under the water. So technically sure you're underwater, but mm. um, you know, we're, our vision is to be completely submerged and like to have different methods of being able to get into it. Yeah. The prototype, the very original concept, you're probably going to have to scuba dive down into it. But, you know, long vision is that, you know, Brennan said he'd like to be able to get his grandma to be able to go out there and she's probably not going to get into a scuba suit to do it. So, you know, we're, we want to make this accessible for absolutely everybody to do. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about, could it also be used as some kind of security room? Let's say if you have a natural disaster and you can just go underwater and be safe. Yeah, we've, we actually just, uh, released a episode on our podcast that we did i mean as we're talking about this now we're living in a weird time in world history with this coronavirus thing going on that you know we released an episode talking about this would be an option for people if they truly wanted to isolate and um, get some serious social dis dis distancing you know this could be an option for that you know to really get away just like you know people have 
people have fallout shelters, people have bunkers, they have whatever to be able to survive during whether it's a pandemic like this or if there was a war of some sort, whatever it may be, you know, th- this is absolutely an option that people could utilize. Mm. So we have a variety of options actually that you can use this underwater colonization. We want people to be able to do it for, you know, enjoyment, but I mean, there is the option to, you know, have it as that reason. Yeah. Sounds very good. Yeah, the, the, the design behind it really, you know, as it, as it migrated over the years, it became a multifunctional habitat where we don't care what you do with it. It's, it was initially designed as, as a place for humans to live, but hey, if you want to buy this thing and turn it into a, an underwater, you know, storage shed, you could do that if you really wanted to. It's, I mean, it's your money. You buy the thing. You do what you want to do with it, type of thing. It's how we kind of envision the design layout of it, so that you can change it into, like I said, like a data center. You could have a, a bunker, a house. You can even just fill it up with like archives. If you let's say, like you know, you got a bunch, an office that has tons of uh, files that you want to protect. It could be an underwater archive center of, of physical papers if you really want to do that. I mean, the, the, like I said, the, the options are endless. It's for what you want to do with it. Mm, I see. Are there any competitors out there, like from any other country, for instance? Yeah, there, like I said, there's actually only two that exist. Right, there's one in Florida right now, which is a you scuba dive down to it. It's in 40 feet of water, and it's in a lagoon in Florida. It's been around for quite a while. Um, it's the only one that's open to the public, um, and it's called Jules Undersea Lodge. Uh, and then there's a science community one. But as far as other people trying to do it, sure, there's there's been, as I've you know followed this for so long, I've seen multiple companies say, hey, we're going to build the first underwater hotels, and they come and they go. Uh, the, one of the biggest one that still has a website, but it's been inactive for six or seven years is Poseidon Undersea Resorts. And their website's still there, very cool design, very cool options, um, but they're not doing anything with it anymore. There's been others that are out there. So yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of people that have this idea, but nobody's been able to capitalize on it. And in one of our podcasts, I even said, I think part of the problem is they all start off with this idea, this giant underwater hotel they're trying to build. And they're starting way big at the very beginning. And that takes like a billion dollars probably for them to be able to build this. And I think they're starting off way too big, too fast uh, versus the method we're going, which I, obviously I think is the right one. That's why we're going that way, but we're starting off small and then growing big. So it's just a, a difference of opinion on how to attack this, this venture. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, there are other ones out there. Um, and it, it's, it, you do a quick search for underwater hotels. I mean, like Adam said, you'll find a bunch of ones that are just like a room underwater and stuff along those lines. But you'll find some other companies out there that are trying to do the same thing. Mm, I see. What would be the next phase now? Money. After the, <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I still, honestly, right now, it, just, it boils down to money. Um, even without the money, you know, I'm self-funding a lot of this. I have a, a second part-time job that all that money goes into Atlanta Sea Colony. And that's how we do all the social media funding and you know, whatever we need to do is, is going from that, but that's still a limited amount of funds and we can only go so far so fast with that money. Uh, I'll get it done. Uh, if I have to do all self-fund it, but I'd like to do it a whole lot faster with people. You know, we have a Patreon, we've had Kickstarters and stuff in the past, but we weren't nearly as big on social media back then when I tried that before too. So like I said, we've got a Patreon right now for people to be able to help us out with this project if they want to do that. Um, but yeah, once the money gets in there, we build the, the first one, uh, say, hey, here's what we got, Here, show it off, and then we can start really building the production ones at that point in time. To, to jump off of, oh, I'm sorry, to, to jump off of what Brendan said, um, one of the things that like I've been trying to help with is growing the our, our social media, get the followers, get people interested in the project, because eventually, our, you know, our hope is that with enough followers, there's going to be people that are going to be willing to donate even a small amount of money to help us do this. Cause I think we've kind of accepted unless we find that, that one person that is willing to, to gamble on us, to, to write that check for us, that this will be either self-funded or group funded, like bet- by like a Patreon or a Kickstarter, which, which is fine. Mm. But I mean, really it's all about, um, yeah, being able to have a community that is behind it and um, just, even if they can't offer the money to be able to offer to help us to share the, share the vision with people. And, you know, once we roll with 
you know, the, the prototype, like you said, maybe the first, the first prototype might not be the prettiest thing you'll see, but if we can prove that it works, then I think we've, we've reached a level of success to where we can prove to anybody that does have the money to, to be able to say, all right, we've done this and we did it by ourselves. Now all we need is you to, you know, buy it from us or, you know, give us a little bit of money to make it a little bit prettier and it's yours and you can do what you want with it. Mm. Now that you talk about pretty, have you also done some analysis before? And like, uh, Brent, I know you're from the IT, IT background. You have an IT yeah, background. Yeah. And right. you, Adam, uh, manufacturing. Have you done some structural analysis, CFD, maybe computational fluid dynamics kind of stuff already? So when I met with the engineering firm, that was one of the things that, that we talked a lot about. And one of the things that were adamant, that, hey, you know, here's what we're going to do, all this kind of stuff. Obviously, at that point in time, we didn't, we didn't do anything just because of the cost of what everything was going to run. Um, but what we ended up doing is with the designs is we copied other habitats that have been out there. So we know that the, the structural analysis of what we're doing, especially at the depth that we're going, is fine. Um, you know, as we go deeper and deeper, that completely changes things. But as long as we say pretty shallow for the first one, you're not having to worry about a bunch of these structural issues that you might, if we got 100, 200 feet, but, you know, we're saying less than 60 feet. It's, it's not too much different than having, as long as it's watertight, that's about the only thing you really have to worry about at that, at that level for the most part. So it's not a huge concern at this point in time. But as we grow, it will become more of a concern. But at that point in time, we'll have the funds behind us to be able to worry about those those issues. Um, but at this time, it's it's not as big of a concern as people would think it would be. Mm, I see. Have you also thought about which material you use? I would be kind of interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> We've had lots of conversations about that. We've talked about everything from concrete to steel to plastics to everything. And we've talked, actually, I was at a trade show earlier this year and talking to some people about it. And, and it, there is no, you do it this way. You know, it, everybody's got their own opinion. And so it's really what, what do you want to do with it? We, right now, we've set it on steel with fiberglass. Um, a mixture of those two for the structure. One company said, hey, go concrete and steel. I'm not a huge fan of going concrete, but so we're looking at steel and fiberglass as of right now. They're both fairly cheap, and uh, and that's what we're looking at right now is cheap and what will work to get the, to test it out. <laughs> yeah, so, but yeah, down the, ro down the road, you know, obviously there's, there's some companies that are 3D printing. You know, there's a 3D printed submarine right now. Mm -hmm. So obviously that's nice down the road where you can 3D print in a plastic or a steel or whatever like that. But that's way down the road, obviously, and a whole lot more money. But for right now, we're looking at steel, which is cheap. And most people, that's what they use underwater anyway. Um, and then uh, covered in fiberglass for protection. Mm, sounds good. Also, now that you just echoing what you said about your Patreon, I will just put every link that you sent uh, yeah. me down in the description and everybody can check them out like um patreon your website etc so cool. i think by the, by the way your website looks quite like minimalistic but quite uh, interesting so i like and actually I, I, we've got a more i'm actually i'm getting ready to redo the website and it's a little bit even minimal because even as it is i think that some people get lost with having multiple pages so i'm trying to shrink it down to a single page mm -hmm. so i'm trying to condense it all and actually that that's probably gonna go live probably next week or something like that oh sounds good okay but the address will stay the same anyway. So yeah, everything will stay the same. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. So any other anything you would like to to tell the audience, Adam? <laughs> really, uh, like I, I just want to echo what I've said earlier is that I mean the biggest thing that we can do right now is just to be able to get a following and get a community that's behind it because. I be, one of the, the coolest things that I think has happened since um, I've since I've been able to be aboard is that we've we've built relationships with a lot of different people. Like uh, there's there's a community all about seasteading, which is you know ha having floating platforms out in the ocean that have um, you know houses and stuff like that. Um, we've met with that community. We've we've uh, had a lot of engineers and. Um, people with just different types of backgrounds message us and talk with us about it. So, I mean, we've learned a lot just from people giving us their input. And, um, you know, we, up until this coronavirus thing hit, I mean, we were scheduled to um, go speak at a conference down in Texas to, at like an international space development conference. You know, we were invited there with the Seasteaders to to talk about, um, you know, 
just different uh, oceanic type habitation and the relationship that has with space. So, I mean, just by, like I said, growing our community, it's creating the opportunities to make new relationships with people that can offer help, whether it's financial help or just have some skill set or knowledge to um, offer us to, to progress this thing forward. So, I mean, that's, that's been the coolest thing and what's going to end up helping make this thing a reality. Mm, I completely agree with you here, like uh, socializing with people and maybe someone who might seem unimportant, like quote unquote, might have like a huge impact in the future. And, mm -hmm. um, what I thought about my Brandon, uh, I told Adam when we first had a call that you could upload your model to, because I work for a company called SimScale, maybe you know about that. It's mm -hmm. basically like a cloud-based simulation ecosystem. You could basically upload your model there and do some structural analysis on it or maybe CFD. Mm -hmm. And what we could do or what could offer you is like that we write some kind of blog post about your project. And as we have like over 150,000 users, you could gain maybe, even it's like a very small conversion, maybe interest yeah. in your project and get some followings out of that. So. The yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. If you all right, yeah, we can talk about. We can definitely talk about that. <laughs> See, just uh, through this, we were able to make a like a professional connection here. There you go. <laughs> that helped us out. <laughs> and, and you know, the echo on Adam there, he was talking a lot about you know space and stuff along those lines. And that's one of the biggest questions I think we get is why? Why would you even want to do this? I mean, everybody's looking at Mars and and the Moon and stuff along those lines. So who cares about going underwater and colonizing the ocean? And you know, it, and I, you know, I've, I, my rebuttal is is why space? I mean, sure, there's, I, you know, I get, I get the answer why people in space. It's you know, it's it's unexplored. It's it's an, uh, for Elon. It's a, uh, a Earth two in case something catastrophic happens here. But at the same time, we have seventy percent of the Earth unexplored and uninhabited. Um, and so while we're here and while we're doing that, um, why not take advantage of that? And anything we do underwater can be mimicked to space. The habitats we build under here are a testing ground for what we're going to do on, on Mars and what we're going to do on other planets because it's isolated, self-contained in a foreign alien environment underwater, which we can then transplant that to the Mars or, or wherever whatever planet you're going to go to. So whatever we learn by doing this, that technology can be taken where elsewhere. And NASA realizes this and already does that. So, mm, yes, yeah. Like thinking about underwater and like um, maybe nature itself, do you think there will be any problems like when it comes to organizations like Greenpeace, etc.? Like saying, hey, we've, what are you doing? <laughs> we've, that was one of the questions that I brought up with Brenda, not, you know, in a, we, we've had plenty of people that come at us that are like, don't do this because all you're going to do is destroy, uh, you know, nature. And one of the things that um, we're adamant about is that, A, we're going to do this in an environmentally friendly way. We're not going to go look for a coral reef to destroy just so we can put a habitat down there. There, you know, there's plenty of seafloor out there that you can use without destroying the, the ecosystem with it. And one of our friends in the, um, Seasteading Institute had they're having the same issue, but one of the things that they're realizing is that when certain structures are introduced to the environment, like the marine environment, that it actually becomes a like fish are almost attracted to it. So as long as you're not putting anything like toxic or anything in the water, you're not like scaring away the 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 sea life. You're not destroying anything. If anything, they're going to come towards it. They're going to want to check out what you have down there. I mean. Um, we talked about Jules Undersea Lodge. The, I mean, one of the cool things about Jules Undersea Lodge is when you go down there, you can see the marine life just swim around you the whole time. It's, I mean, we we are going to be committed to making sure that we're not going to go destroy anything, and nor do we think that we're going to disrupt anything by doing that. If I think, Brendan, you'd agree with that part? Yeah, I, I, say, I think, you know, initially there's going to be a little bit of disruption. When you put anything into a foreign environment, there's going to be a slight disruption for a period of time. But the the effect that we will have base, basically making a a coral reef of ourselves with, with the structure itself or, around there, um, we add back to the environment. And what I tell people is that if we are the first ones to do this, we have to set the precedent on how this looks. If we're, if we're the first ones to do this, 
we set the rules on, hey, if you're building underwater structures, you have to do them that are, you know, environmentally friendly and adding back to the environment. And in fact, in some terms, they grow the environment more than it was before. So I think we have to be very vocal about that and make sure that we are doing our due diligence moving forward in that area because it is important and it is a, a trigger for a lot of people that we have to be conscious of. Mm, yeah, I see. But it also might be helpful in like in countries like Indonesia where you have a lot of dense like population where you can use the yeah. sur- like war- ocean water just to build underwater habitats and, and maybe exactly this dense population. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Completely. As Adam mentioned, like echoing again what Adam said, like in case of a pandemic, like to to get this flatten flatten curve kind of scenario, just to yeah, get an underwater habitat and then yeah, yeah, that's that's where I'd be right now if I had one. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely okay. Um, My wife wouldn't let me go by myself, so I, I wouldn't be able to go. <laughs> I have to rough it out with them. The, plan, the first plan is to have it like in shallow water, right? Too- yeah, yeah, we're we're looking at you know 40, 40 feet more or less. Okay, so pretty shallow. Once again, for multiple reasons. One, because the structure issues are the thing. We want to make sure that it's watertight and it just proves the concept more than anything. But after that, then we can start looking at going deeper than that. But we don't want to go super deep. You know, sixty feet would be the max at the very beginning, just so we're we're able to prove that hey, we can be underwater. We can stay down there for periods of time, and it works fine. Mm, I see. Although you might be like in an early phase, what what I came up with now is the idea like of security measurements. Like how would you like in case of if it's not water or if it's watertight and then over time it might become not watertight like or any leaks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's once again that that's you want to make sure you've got redundancies of any sort uh, with different sensors and stuff along those lines. But it's one of those things where constant exterior monitoring whether it's and keeping it shallow you can do that you can go out once a day and scuba dive around the thing and check it all out to make sure it all looks good mm. and spot checks on that once you start getting deeper and deeper that becomes harder to do unless you start to use robots and stuff on those lines rovs to monitor that but as long as we keep it shallow at the beginning we can monitor all these things um and make sure that the the design we've got works long term mm, i got that it makes absolute sense i share your vision i Kind of inspired yeah. to share to to give your voice and uh, no man we're always welcome it yeah awesome uh, do you want to say, say anything else to the audience like in terms of your project or yeah I mean I, I was like you're gonna put all the links down there but it's Atlanta Sea Colony and it's Atlantis C S E A not just the letter C but yeah. Atlantis <laughs> Um we're on all socials pretty much you know Facebook Twitter Instagram TikTok Reddit uh, we've each YouTube. actually. YouTube, um, You're covering actually everything, we're on, even TikTok. It's like, yeah, don't do much on TikTok, but we're on there. And we, even on, <laughs> we're we're plat- experimenting with everything. <laughs> we went on to the, because yeah. it's quite hard actually, like in the social media business, to grow. And once you re- reach like this critical mass, then it becomes quite easy. But once uh, up until you reach that, yeah. point, it takes so much time. And you know, mm-hmm. what I mean, if you're in the YouTube business or Instagram and. Yeah, and our and our YouTube isn't all that popular. I mean, we got some followers, and we we push stuff out there, but we don't we don't put as much content out there as we probably should on YouTube. Uh, you know, we put our podcast and some other stuff out there, but it's something we definitely need to look be looking at more because it is a a big audience. But no, uh, beyond that, you know, it's once again I appreciate you having us on more than anything. Absolutely. You know, this is, and having to talk with you and, and be able to share this vision with somebody else. And, and it seems like you get it. And, and that's just great. That's, that's ultimately, that's all I care is that other people share this vision and get it and are excited about it. Even if something was to happen to me and I don't, we, we don't make this happen that somebody else can carry it on and have that vision and do it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely on that. And, um, I mean, even if I would have like a big following, like, I don't know, maybe hundred K subs or something yeah. like that, I would have invited you because uh, I think, um, just giving like small people a voice is like very important because what I see yep. like, sometimes on YouTube, only the big ones play with the big players and yep. the smaller ones mm-hmm. just are like forgotten forever. So yeah. um, it doesn't really matter what kind of following I have. I mean, I'm only at f- around 3K subs, but who cares? Like yeah, I'm getting the exactly. idea out. I'm offering you this blog post on SimScale where we can do some CFD analysis around your structure, getting like 150k users that we have seeing the blog post maybe getting even if it's just 100 150 people inspired yeah. i mean why not and then as you said carrying this this uh, vision that you have on to other people mm-hmm. that's the goal excellent yeah definitely very cool 
It was a pleasure having you on my first podcast. I hope it will be. <laughs> no, thank you for thank having you us. Much. Sure, no worries.